right, folks, welcome to another live and interactive positive aging discussion. I am really excited about today's discussion. I've been looking forward to it for quite some time. And uh, but before we get to meet Sam and Susan Simon and talk about uh, Dementia Man, the performance and the things Sam is going through. We have a little bit of housekeeping items and I've got a treat for you today too. Um, so first off, the uh, the most important thing is, is that these discussions are brought to you by the Positive Aging Community. We're a community of older adults, family members and, and, uh, and professionals that uh, seek to provide people with choices and, uh, and options and support. And um, the, these discussions and Positive Aging Sourcebook are brought to you free of charge, thanks to the support of our Positive Aging Community Champions. And you're gonna get to meet one here in just a couple of minutes. Uh, and uh, that's really related to our topic today. But uh, it's easy to connect with all of the Positive Aging Community Champions on our website, which is proaging.com, uh, right up here at the top. However, I will tell you, if you're looking for a resource and you can't find it, just shoot me an email. I am more than happy to help you make connections or schedule time on my calendar, and I will brainstorm with you and, and, and we'll help you move in a direction that provides you with more choices. You can also order free copies of the source book right up here on the right-hand side. And then today's discussion, along with over 350 other discussions, is recorded. And those recordings are on the left-hand side of the screen there. Uh, this recording will be available later this afternoon, so you could share it with your uh, loved ones or your coworkers or somebody that you think that it might be helpful for. In addition, we will also include the uh, chat transcript there so that you don't necessarily have to take notes uh, today while your folks are sharing their information. Um, on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see what we've got for our upcoming discussions. And um, we have some pretty cool upcoming discussions here to close out the month of September. On Friday, we're going to learn about these height adjustable features that can be installed in our homes. So check this out. And hopefully you can see on the screen, this kitchen cabinet comes all the way down to countertop level. So somebody can actually use that top shelf of their kitchen cabinet. This, uh, you can see this gentleman who's sitting at a cooktop. That cooktop actually moves up and down. And you see, we've got a closet that comes down as well. Uh, we're gonna get to learn all about these innovative features that can make our homes uh, better for us as we, no matter what our age, income or disability. Um, and I'm babbling here. And that is a good sign to advance the slide and then just show you what we've got to finish out the month. But I'm especially excited about our discussion on Tuesday, September 26, because we're going to learn about a new approach to home sharing and uh, an innovative idea that they're launching in Northern Virginia with shared homes for women who are age 55 plus. So we got a bunch of stuff going on. You can find out all about it at the proaging.com website, but we're not talking about what we've got coming up in the future. Today, we are talking about dementia. And before I introduce you to our, our primary panel member today, Sam Simon, I really want to give you the opportunity, give us the opportunity to spotlight a positive aging community champion that is doing some great things that's good when living. And they have this wonderful program called Stronger Memory that's run by Jessica Fredrickson. Jessica, thanks for uh, tuning in. And uh, I'm real excited for you to share with our community a little bit about the Stronger Memory program. Thanks, Steve. Really excited to be here and to listen to, to Sam and what he has to say. Uh, the Stronger Memory Program is a brain health exercise program, really simple exercises, reading aloud, writing by hand, and doing simple math problems quickly for about 20 to 30 minutes a day, five days a week. 
has been shown to improve that working memory and recall. So especially that that working memory of, oh, I walked into the kitchen. What did I come in here for? Um, that that really key piece um, of short term memory. Um, we are excited to share that with people all across the country. I was just looking at our uh, partners today. We have about 180 organizations across the country who are doing Stronger Memory and uh, approaching 20,000 individuals. So we, um, oh, thanks, Steve. Yep, you can uh, check it out at strongermemory.org. It takes you right to our page. The workbook is available for free. Um, we want to make this accessible to everybody. It's it's simple and easy, and we want to be able to share it. Uh, so if you're interested, check out the website and, yep, strongermemory.org. You can read about it, download a copy in English or Spanish, and um, then you can learn learn more about it there. I, I love it. And yeah. so what I love about the Stronger Memory program is, is that we all know that we need to exercise our brains. And we know that, you know, we've, we've all heard that, but it's sort of like, there's so many things that are out there. And a lot of times, you know, they're, they're software programs or doing, you know, um, uh, something like that. I like the simplicity of the Stronger Memory program. And when I've talked to people that have done it, is that the other thing is, is that you work with a lot of groups. So it's a lot of people are doing this as a family or as a group of friends or it, with the senior center, with your friends there. Is that correct, Jessica? Absolutely. It brings that social component together. So whether you're doing it with a friend or family member, um, we have a lot of pairs that call each other on the phone and read aloud every day. Uh, which is great. And we do have groups as well. And we've got all the tools needed for people who want to do this in a group. Um, definitely that social connection with the simple exercises is so important for our brain health. All right. Well, uh, Jessica, if you want to hang on for a couple of minutes, we will now bring uh, Sam Simon and his wife, Sue Susan, to the stage. And then um, uh, folks, uh, one thing, Jessica is available. So one thing that I didn't tell you is the best part about these discussions is they're live and interactive. So just like Muhammad, uh, basically, oh, wow, Muhammad is greetings from Alzheimer's Pakistan. This is amazing worldwide audience today. Wow, you're international, Steve. <laughs> so, so we've got, you got three ways to interact. You can chat like Muhammad did. You can use that Q&A button at the bottom of the screen, or you can raise your little virtual hand and I'll open up your mic and, and you can ask a question and Jessica will be on hand. So throw something into chat if you if you want to interact with her. But today, the, the star of the show is, is, is Sam and Susan Simon. And uh, for those of you who don't know, um, Sam Simon has been diagnosed with dementia and he wrote a play that he actually performs. I saw the play at the Capitol Fringe Festival. Sam, I was in tears. I laughed, but most importantly, I left there just feeling like I was watching like just the most innovative art form to sort of get people thinking about what if this happens to me? And the coolest thing about the performance I went to was we had a conversation afterwards where everybody who attended the play, we had a conversation with Sam about all kinds of things. There were some people in there that were really into theater, asking him about, you know, is the art form, but there was a bunch of people in there reflecting on, you know, what happened to their mom, and they wish they had seen a play like this before it happened to them, and I'm going to think differently about things. So, so hats off to you, Sam, for, for this, and we'll talk a lot about that, and I'm delighted that Sam's wife, Susan, is here, too, because I've known Susan for years. She used to work in senior living in an assisted living community. And for those people that work in senior living, just uh, uh, this should be very apparent. Just because we help people in this area does not mean that we are immune to it. 
everybody can can be faced with health challenges. And uh, I think a lot of times those of us who serve uh, folks sort of feel like, uh, well, yeah, hey, it's them, and this is not this is not going to happen to me. It can happen to all of us. Um, so, uh, so let's kick off this discussion. Jessica, thanks so much for your support, and I hope folks reach out to um, to get involved with the Stronger Memory program. And uh, Sam, I I'm thrilled to um, uh, kick this discussion off. And uh, and folks, you're going to help me out, right? You're going to ask questions of Sam and, and Susan, and uh, uh, you just jump in there and, and, and feel free to do that. So um, first off, uh, the um, uh, Sam, tell us a little bit about yourself. I know you've had a very interesting career, and you could probably talk the whole hour about that, but give us, give us the highlights. And uh, and then let's move into how you discovered that you had uh, dementia. So um, I have early stage Alzheimer's. And I do want to note that tomorrow is uh, World Alzheimer's Awareness Day. And uh, we will probably touch base on some of that in a minute. Um, <clears throat> the, so I came to Washington, D.C. area. We live in McLean, Virginia. In 1970, to uh, out of law school to uh, work for Ralph Nader, I have to say that was 53 years ago. Some pe people might not remember who he is, <laughs> but true. back then he had he he was uh, collecting from his lawsuit against General Motors. He wrote a book called "Unsafe at Any Speed," and in fact, most of our auto safety comes from his work. And it was a really exciting and high visibility uh, time for me and Susan. We were very fortunate to uh, come. I was born and raised in El Paso, Texas. Uh, Susan's from Houston. Uh, we've been married this now 57 years. We met while in college. Uh, and in the play, I note that nobody thought it was a particularly good idea. <laughs> but so far, it's worked out. Uh, <laughs> but you never know, I'm teasing. Um, and I'm... You know, I've been fortunate and had a very successful and wonderful career in the Washington, D.C. area since that time and worked for Ralph twice. I'm, my sense is I was a, a bit of a minor celebrity, got to get on TV around the breakup of AT&T and was even on Oprah Winfrey show once. But that was a long time ago. I created a public affairs firm, but was fortunate through some of my work in public interest to, to spend some time um, in New York with a um, nonprofit social justice ministry, you know, I'm a nice Jewish boy, it's in the play, but, um, and it was sort of there, I did some improv training and serious improv training in New York, discovered my, you know, sort of the interest and energy around theater and, at that time, um, it was in the early 2000s, could see how th art, theater, music, could come to believe it, that, in fact, uh, people's minds are more likely to be changed by emotion than by fact, that art and music and theater can both help change minds. It can, they can also be healing. Um, and so my first play that I wrote that I found is called The Actual Dance, and that was in two, first performed in 2013. Yes, and Susan, that's our wedding picture from 1966. Yes, um, <laughs> Susan in 2000 uh, was diagnosed with uh, advanced breast cancer. And in fact, there was a time in her diagnosis where the world went dark, when I mean the world, the medical world and didn't think she would survive. And I had to confront being with someone I love as they would take their last breath. I somehow, years later, Susan is obviously fine, fully recovered. I, I, you know, I almost don't even know why or how, but it was through this improv work that I, I began talking about my experience seven, eight years later and found that play. And so I, my work in theater. So fast forward, 
yeah, around 2016, 2017, I started um, experiencing some cognitive issues, but we don't know what they are. When they, like, I don't know what they are. Uh, confusion, I remember early on, I complained to one of my, in, my internists at the time that about my memory. And he looks at me and says, oh, look, you're, you're just fine. You know, I, I call it in the play, overeducated um, men overreacting to normal aging. Mm -hmm. That's what the doctors are saying. And that, by the way, is a problem. Because if you are like me, you begin to experience some things and you get dismissed, you need to learn, to, I needed to do it too, to how to push back. Because he was just absolutely positive. The funny part, I'll be quick, is he said, now, if you couldn't remember what you had for breakfast, then I'd worry about you. And I go, breakfast? What the heck did I have for breakfast? Oh. So, <laughs> now, but this was a line, scheduled me with a social worker. Yeah. Uh, Sam, let me let me pause for a moment yeah. because I, I really want to dive into your... Um, what this story but before we do i want to just reiterate uh and 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 get susan uh to make a little comment here so what came first you you wrote this book the actual dance um correct i did yeah yeah yeah, yeah. susan susan i mean sam wrote the book the actual dance about the experience of going through having a loved one with uh, breast cancer and yeah. th was did you write the book before the play or did the play come before the book before play the came book? before the book okay and the, then the play came first susan I, I you know sam has just made every married man uh just seem <laughs> like we're insignificant what was that like to have your loved one you know honor this journey that you went through with a play and a book was, were you comfortable with this? And and like, how did you, how did this make you feel? I th it, it took a while um, for me to become comfortable with it. I'm not one that likes to be the center of attention at all. Um, and um, I, I, it brought back a lot, many times, lots of memories that you put away. So it it was like, okay, it's it's coming back. But I kept saying to him, and we had discussions about this, I don't have cancer anymore. I'm I'm okay, you know. So it was uh, some performances were more emotional than others. And <clears throat> I, I, I now sitting on the other side, when he performs, I can feel how he must have felt about the whole situation. It puts everything sort of in perspective. Um, and it, and, and it is, it isn't easy for the partner ever. So, no, and and I'll tell you, um, I'm glad you brought that up. And your your relationship has this very unique perspective because as I was listening to, as I was in the audience for the performance of the um, of Dementia Man, I was thinking about you, and I was like, "Wow, what is this like to relive this?" You know, because it does put a lot of there's a lot of pressure and emotion on the spouse. But I think the fact that Sam has already you've already been involved in a performance in a book that it makes you a very ideal partner to be a part of this journey that that Sam has created. You know, I don't I love that because I don't think we've thought about that. Right. That we um, haven't necessarily focused. We do talk about, you know, the, the roles have switched. Yeah. And I was caught my I call the love partner in that journey. And and now it's I don't want to say that I, I say it's her turn, but it is her turn. And you never, you know, there's a tragedy aspect of that. You don't want it to happen. And as that, and at the same time, it's a privilege. Mm -hmm. okay. You know, the, the ultimate gift I've come to believe 
in a love relationship is to be able to hold that person or be with that person, so, you know, and make sure that they feel loved as they go through their journey. And it, it is a privilege, actually. No, a absolutely. Uh, for better, for worse, as they say. And, right. Uh, right. So the uh, okay. So now let's get back to your journey. So you started having changes that 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 concerned you at least. Um, out of curiosity, uh, Susan, d did you sort of see changes in Sam, or was this more internal on his end at the at this point? It was more internal on his end, mm -hmm. um, because as you said before, we have worked in the industry, your mind is very different, and you were thinking more in terms of those you had worked with in a different setting, and all of this is put in perspective. I, I think back about it, and I think about conversations I had with families, and I'm going, oh, my, if I had only, I should have paid more attention to what he was telling me earlier, you know, but also the, the, the doctor, our doctor, our family doctor said to me, is this his personality or is this happening? And that made me think at that point that to pay attention to what was going on. Okay, great. And I want to respond to a question that just came in. It says, will Sam be performing today? And I want to let everybody know that no, Sam is not going to be performing today. This is just an interview with Sam and Susan on the journey that they've gone through. He's going to talk about the, the play in that journey, but I want to share with everybody, Sam has been very busy. And at least if you're in the mid-Atlantic up to New Jersey, there are um, a variety of performances and more to come that are being added to the calendar. And I'm, I'm sharing that on the screen, but I'm also sharing it in uh, chat for everybody. Um, so, but what my, what my goal today, folks, is I loved the performance, but I'm interested in now just hearing that narrative and the story of um, of a man and and his wife discovering that he has been diagnosed with dementia and and the steps that have taken. So hopefully that that gives you all a, a, a glimpse. So um, so okay, Sam. So you had some concerns. You went to the doctor. You you talked about how he dismissed that. And well, no, let me just add, and it's so. It's over a period of time now. So I, I, I met, they gave me a, a mild um, um, antidepressant for that first time. You know, it may have a hit, may have hidden some of the symptoms or minimized them or made me worry less. It was many years later, again, the doc, my primary doctor, you know, I would have very, in retrospect, distinct and alarming um, experiences, including driving on the wrong side of the road. Luckily, no accidents. Accidents, and but I began to develop a particular symptom that it sounds weird. So I'm going to tell it anyway. It, in the play, I call it uh, new and weird. But it felt as if, and I don't even say felt. I experienced. What I and what I felt and experienced. So I'm doing this. I always do this. That on one half of my brain, I there was an infinite nothingness. That if I wanted to remember something, I, would, I have an internal eyes that would look that way. Sorry, I don't want to hit you. And, <laughs> and it would just be infin infinity. And it scared me, and it worried me, and I didn't understand it. I mentioned it, and in, in a session with the doctor, again saying, "Well, you're just probably a little depressed." Oh, and I told him about that. That's when he referred me to a neurologist. Okay. And um, I have now in this, that was in um, 20, early 2018, maybe 2017, because I'm my final diagnosis with mild cognitive impairment came in 2018. Okay. And, and 
I went through the process and you know, I'm now very deeply involved in the, I hate, by the way, I hate the word dementia movement and the patient side of things. And my experience I've learned is not unique. And in fact, it's fairly unfortunately typical. And, you, and I will tell folks that in the play, the way that you artistically uh, demonstrated that infinity was very effective um and the and so then the next part of the play that i really want you to elaborate on is you 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 started going to neur a neurologist and the challenges of you know t t tell a little bit about that story and there's there's a shocking element in the play that certainly drew some tears from me in the response that one of the neurologists gave you when you got your diagnosis. Well, it's the first, the, I went to the, so our first neurologist, he, he, it was the same thing. We went to see him. He was, oh, all right, all right. Then I told him about the infinite nothing space. And he, he schedules me for every study of the electronic study of the brain that exists. I go through them, he geez up the gazoo. And, um, that's what got me the the to the neuropsychologist for the uh, neuropsychological exam that got me diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment. But then when I came in to get the formal from the neurologist, it was just, well, you know, you we have the MRI in the brain. There are no black tangles. We had no idea what they meant. Um, you know, he, he had a 15-minute appointment to say, you've got, um, yes, you do have MCI, mild cognitive impairment. Um, good news, you don't have any uh, black tangles in the brain, I've got to go. And I stopped him and said, well, what, what does this mean? What's my uh, prognosis? What, what treatments? What, what? We have this, we're new. We had the silly idea I could get well. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he gets a bit short with this and says, well, wait, you know, I've got patients waiting. There's only one road for you, Sam, you're going to get worse. Um, and then he remembered, said, well, maybe you should have some Aricept. Now, I've since learned Aricept is sort of the last in the dr available drugs for this kind of thing. It, it can help, but it's the last one. And he didn't even schedule a follow-up appointment. Yeah. And, yeah. and so we were, at, we were literally at sea. And luckily, we had a friend who's, I say luckily, but whose friend had passed away from a cognitive disease who recommended a different neurologist. Also, I went to the Georgetown Hospital Memory Center. And again, you wanna make sure you're getting the correct, and we have three independent diagnoses now, and I am in a drug trial. So there is no question. People will hear me today and they'll look at us. He can't have Alzheimer's. I can guarantee you, if you will, I'll spend two hours we can go through the little, the unhappy stuff. <laughs> well, no, no, absolutely. Yeah. And that's one of the main reasons why I wanted to have you on is, is that the, the fact is, is, is that yes, here's somebody that has a diagnosis and driven wrong ways down the roads, not knowing where he is in when, when he was out in the community. But I think in the play, you really illustrate this, the, amount of time that it took number one to get into the neurologist the amount of time that it took to get yeah. the results but then the, so you've invested all this time and i imagine you weren't sleeping that well while you're waiting for this and then you are as you had just said he get, delivers the results to you and it's sort of like you're going to get worse and i can't really help you i got to see other patients the but then you had to get on the treadmill again to schedule another meeting with a, 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 a neurologist that I think you said that the outcome was better, but it's still, you don't just get to go um, get the diagnosis uh, that afternoon. Well, right. right. And by the way, I, what you're referring to, and I've, we could call the play six more weeks, couldn't we? <laughs> uh, because it, it, and again, I love it. I wrote this play and I just realized in the delivery that there's a rhythm to it. And it took six. The audience almost sometimes chants with us six more weeks yeah. before you can get the net. Uh, 
It is. It's a very long, it's frustrating. You know, think, I'm going to jump in a way to the end here, but I'll come right back. Is there is a lot of good news coming and reform, and but it's coming from a way long way back. And the, the, I've learned that my because my experience is not unique. And there is this thing, well, there's nothing good we can do about it. Let me, get, I got to go. You know, the doctor side, they don't know what to do when they can't, when there's not medicine to cure. They, and they're delivering hard news by doctors, you know, the human beings, but, you know, that's also a challenge for me. As much as when we like our current neurologist, he's been the new one. And his, how he delivered the news that it was Alzheimer's, was it's in the play. And, you know, I, he could do some training, but it's okay. Uh, but delivering well, really bad news to people is, I, you know, I, I want to be empathetic to that. But it is also a, a, a very difficult process. And, you know, I'm going to jump a little bit, but, you know, it puts me and us into a, at least a period of time of not knowing what to do. Mm -hmm. and yeah yeah i think your um you, your your story here and the play reveals that we need to be more creative in how we um in the resources that we that we offer people to be diagnosed and then you know helping them with that and i think like you said there is good news and there's good news and bad news. The good news, the bad news is this, we're living longer and this is impacting a lot more people, right. but because it's impacting more people, we will see change. It can't happen soon enough. And your story reveals that in just, it, I, when I was at the in the play and you were telling the story, it's sort of like this whole process of when you were thinking about uh, that there could be something wrong with me to where you get the diagnosis is the span of years, you know, uh, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now I want to address something uh, uh, because it was a very emotional part of the play. And I, I, I had questions in terms of how much of this is reality and how much of it was artistic license. And that's, the sort of the talk about ending your life and the um and and suicide was a number one was that real and b where if if so where was that in this span of um diagnosis and awareness so there is a book and i'm not going to give it i'm not going to mention the name of it okay unfortunately because i don't i'm and by the way, today, this is also Suicide Prevention Month. But there's a book written by a well-known author in which her husband was diagnosed with early stage Alzheimer's, my diagnosis. And the book is about how hard it was for them to get to Switzerland so he could kill himself. The quote in the book is, uh, I, from, she quotes her, her late husband, this have said, I don't want to die, but I don't want to continue to become a lesser and lesser person. And maybe that book did save me in the sense that by the time I was through, I was angry. Now, I found it through uh, an interview of the person where they complained that assisted to company suicide, why isn't it available in the US? But um, um, I had for, a, for an instant, I say in the play, I call it a nanosecond. It's clearly a bit longer. Seriously think of it, maybe this is what I should be doing. And it got me angry that I had to do that. And I think that was actually, oddly, a bit a part of my, because there is the period of time, as strong and as I may, people may think I am now, there was this period as we went through it where we didn't know what to do. And we were, you know, we have... We have adult children, they're professionals. Our daughter is a pediatric dentist. Our son's a lawyer, you know. But, they, you know, I go in. I don't, you know, I'll just, you know, you close in. You don't know what to do. And you think these crazy thoughts. And they're not crazy. They are thoughts. Because it's a very terrible 
it's nobody wants to to have this and you don't know what but and part of it's driven by the stereotypes you know i i have since learned because part of it's because of susan's career and i visit her at her work and we would see the memory credit uh center and those are people who are later stage in very late stage and i think the world here's the word dementia which in the book i want to erase but dementia and they think that person sitting staring at the sky and by the way we don't know what's really going on for that person but they imagine that they imagine late stage and that they're going to fall right into that now, i've since learned and the doctor has said in words but also becomes except it could be five to 10 years before it gets a lot worse or it could happen tomorrow by the way but so you go for the long term you go i mean and it made me think of also as well as susan and anybody who's given a diagnosis of a terminal disease you want to be the outlier of survival the goal becomes how can i become the outlier and, and break the statistical mode it may well be that 80 percent do this and 70 90 percent do that if i can find a way to live and think and behave so that i have a a, a shot an opportunity to be the outlier that's my goal that's our goal mm -hmm. um and susan in some ways is a is in fact an outlier in her journey because most her doctors will tell you now they're they're we're in touch with our oncologist still all these years later and he said we had we did not expect that out, this outcome so you i shoot for the i want i want to be the outlier in this disease and if not yeah, if saying. not i want to do something to help advance the science of treatment mm -hmm. and you know but if somebody kills themselves well maybe there was something unique about them that would have helped every other person right and, and so I, anyway i i don't want to minimize and i'm not i'm i don't want it is a tough journey. We are just so lucky to have had the support in each other to make our way through that dark period, because there was a dark period. And 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 I think that's really important, and it's very il illustrated very well in the play. Is 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 that the like I look at what you've done now with sort of uh, well with writing the play and performing and getting out and talking about this and showing people that, hey, I do have a real diagnosis with dementia, but I can still live a purposeful life. And um, mm -hmm. when when did you sort of leave that dark area and and move into this sort of purposeful living? And you know what your journey reminds me of? And, and folks, if you haven't seen I believe it's called The Last Dance. It's a uh, performer, Glenn Campbell, who toured with with relatively severe dementia mm -hmm. and uh, was able to, you know, share his music with, you know, thousands of people and uh, and 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 live with purpose while he had dementia as well. But but what, what how did you get out of that dark area? Well, it was it was. We were, we're lucky. I mean, um, first of all, I wasn't quiet about it. Now, maybe that's just my personality. I did not hide. And I was telling lots of people and um, sort of living, I've tended to live my life out loud. <laughs> Ralph Nader is your, uh, one of your heroes. Yeah. And then, then I wrote and I had written another play. So maybe it's a gift from Susan that I wrote that other play and was more likely to, to do this. So uh, I was hearing more and seeing more. I, and because I wrote another play and I'm involved in a theater group, it's called Solo Arts Heal, that people do solo shows about medical conditions. And I'll, I'll name her Gail uh, um, uh, Sheekly, who she lives in San Francisco, but she urged me. She, she had seen the actual dance and she was aware of my work. And she was really urging me to do it. And it was really her urging that um, 
you know, pushed me uh, trying to, to, to go ahead and give it a shot and start writing. And I worked with um, folks who had helped me with the actual dance theater, solo art, you know, solo writing isn't done by one person. I have a dramaturg that is like a writing coach. I have a director and I have this community that helped lift me up and encourage me. And then when I, I in January of this year, I, That's I, I um, it's funny I, to me, I did a preview presentation at a conference of a play that I hadn't yet written. So just think about that. I did a 20 minute showcase of a play not yet written that's called magic anyway. Um, and the audience reaction has been so, you know, I feed off of the audience, your reaction, Steve. I mean, it's, it's humbling to, to see the reaction to that. Um, and, um, it has been that energy that I've helped me keep going because I, I'm human, believe it or not. And there are moments when it gets hard and you get tired where you question your, your judgments and whether you've done the right thing and what to do. You know, you see a lot of people, you know, go travel the world while you still can. Go do see every... You know, we interesting. We we actually it's in the book and it's in the, the other play. We had that conversation with Susan when she had what when the doctors went dark. We had what I call the conversation. You sit down with each other mm -hmm. and you say, "What do we do now?" And there are a lot of people who sell everything, go travel the world, go do everything. You you know, fill the bucket list. We actually don't have a bucket list. Our bucket list is to stay around. Right. <laughs> I'm, putting, I'm holding her hand. And thank oh, you. I love it. Um, because um, and her words were, we're not doing things we love now. Let's change, not because you or I might die, because we're not doing what we find important. So it's, you know, like a lot of it is her and having that energy, but the audience and the feedback, your graciousness to do this, has been enormously yeah. inspiring to me. I, to do thank that. you. Well, I got to, uh, during in the play, and I'm going to bring up a picture of you in the performance. For, for you, yeah. you actually have the script there in, whoops. Um, yeah. You have the script there in your hand. And um, the, uh, and you say at the beginning of the play, I have the script to, to oh, whoops, uh, oh, shoot. I'm sorry, I'm looking at another screen while I'm talking to you, that's dangerous. Mm -hmm. You have a script there uh, of the play in the hand. You make no bones about it that I have the script in my hand because I might have to reference it, but you also had somebody in the audience and I forgot what you called her, like a cognitive navigator. Yeah, um, so, so uh, just if I'm, I, I, part of my career, when I was doing Ralph Nader kind of work, I also got very involved in the disability rights movement. I spent 15 years on the board of the World Institute on Disability and um, um, got to know people like the late Judy Ewan, maybe folks who remember her, the, the mother of the modern disability movement and others. And, um, I've lost track of where I'm going with the with, with answering a question. I've lost. Right, no, we are talking about the cognitive nav navigator. Oh, okay. okay. Thank you very much. See, <laughs> it can happen. Uh, um, and so the the accommodations. There are no accommodations right now under under an ADA conceptual framework. Somebody in one of the meetings said the ADA stops at the neck. That there, are, you know, so I, and, and I'm really, it's funny, it just came to me, I was writing, what if we had cognitive navigators? I say, as available as curb cuts. So curb cuts lets the wheelchair people out there. Well, if there's, if the places I go, even maybe on buses, 
or maybe train cabs. You know, they trained a whole fleet of cabs for wheelchairs. They didn't exist before. And now they did it, and so people with wheelchairs can get a cab. Well, maybe there's a cab crew that is trained in dealing with cognitively impaired people. Yeah. And so then they are cognitive navigators. They know how to, they know techniques, they know what they might have to do. They can get us to where we're supposed to be. Maybe every museum will have a cognitive tour guide. Maybe I, I often, you know, I work part time, as I said, in New York for a while. Well, I can I sit there and imagine what if at the train stations there were people who could deal with they deal with people with mobile mobility impairments. Well, maybe they can come and help me get on the train, make sure they know where I'm at, make sure the conductor knows where I'm at, and then I met with somebody uh, at my destination who can make sure. You know, part of it, there'll be people to pick me up or find me, but make sure if you've ever been to Penn Station, you know, it can be a tunnel, <laughs> uh, help me find that so that, and they're identified as, you know, and I didn't know that, but there are certifications now and a certification uh, more in, in, in the context of um, more, you know, assisted living and memory centers but you want to have the same kind of ability to training to deal with people as they do everyday tasks. I, I love it. And when I heard, I love the term too, cognitive navigator, but just so folks know in the audience, when Sam was performing, this woman who has knowledge of theater arts and knows Sam was there to provide cues if you needed them. And I believe you did need her during the performance that I, uh, that I saw. Yes. Um, and uh, there's a bunch of folks that are asking, will this be recorded? I jumped in late. Yes, it, it's recorded. It's going to be at proaging.com uh, later this afternoon, along with Sam's contact information, all of his links and everything. Um, Sam, let me get to some of the questions and comments that are coming in. Um, first, and this is good for some of the people that uh, arrived late. Uh, Jamie says, yes, this sounds very typical based on my mother's experience. Maybe I missed it, but roughly when did Sam start noticing something wasn't right? That time when it was mostly internal to you that had you go to the doctor. So, the, and, and uh, so just like, what was that? Do you remember the year that that was? Uh, that, well, that you, you, you know something, but I, I want to mention two quick things in response to that, because it's a, hard to be precise. Yeah. There are parts of me that for some time felt different than Susan. So again, how do we compare ourselves? How do we know whether we're not normal or different? And a lot of it for me was directional and driving, but specific memory. I still tend to think, well, she's got this fabulous memory. It's more on the other side that I have cognitive impairments. But but so I've always sort of wondered about little parts of that. But it was really a beginning. Um, well, let's see, I, mean, I in the play, you know, the driving thing was 2016. And so this is 2021. It's, it was probably a few years before that. Okay. I have since read, I do want to say again, once we're diagnosed, we'll look back and we'll notice things that were cues. So just, so I ran a public affairs company and it went from just me and a desk to over 25 years to almost 50 people. I did well and I sold and retired, but then, you know, I, I could keep my finances in my brain. And every Sunday, you know, this was years later, every Sunday afternoon, I do quicken. Just boom, boom, boom. It was just habit. And after the diagnosis, I hadn't done it for a year. It was, I'll get to it. All right, I'll get to it. I need to do it Sunday, but I'll get to it. And I started putting those things off, but I didn't understand. I didn't realize that it was something else going on with me. And again, uh, thank God for GPS, because one of my things have been mainly directional and travel. Right. And I will even today, Susan drives with me. I have not stopped driving. 
but you know there'll be moments where I lose. I I just stop. I don't know where I'm at. I can you know I can I can be nearby, but it's nothing looks familiar anymore for a moment, and I have to stop. I have to wait. And it's coming back. Um, but you know, there's always the possibility that somebody's going to find me wandering. That hasn't happened yet. And the blind said, no silver, <coughs> silver, silver alerts yet for Sam Simon. But, you know, so we're, we're spending time, I'm jumping ahead, a lot of time now trying to plan. Um, great, great. Um, lots of thank yous and lots of uh, inspiration uh, that you're offering. And, and, and somebody restated your quote, and <laughs> I love it, is, is that cognitive navigators as available as curb cuts. That's something for us to really think about and not just people with dementia, but also, you know, families that may have a, a child with a cognitive impairment right. or developmental disability. I think that that you're right is, is that we all know when we see somebody in a wheelchair to open the door and to help them up the, the curb, but when you've got cognitive impairment or uh, developmental disabilities, it's it's more invisible and it's like are you making it up uh you, you know how could i be talking right now to a man that's been diagnosed with dementia it's like surely this isn't it people, isn't isn't real people um, roll their eyes sometimes and let me just just to remind people now wheelchairs are really visible you know deaf and blind people are in our theaters because we have audible description we have signing and the advancement to that stage is no bigger a leap than finding cognitive accommodations. You know, there was a time to, to believe that uh, a blind person could, quote, see a, a, a play, because now somebody's in the back, he's got a blue feather and she's swiggling her hips, and she's doing this and that. They hear it, but they don't, but they can be. And if, if you told that to somebody once, they would have laughed. They would have rolled their eyes. So I, and now with, I would just add with the, you know, something that I'm tech savvy, but the AI's evolution and coming, it can be a really, I don't have the specifics, but I think there's a lie. A big pass, a, a, a lot of potential for us, and I. And it's in line to play. I don't know. Maybe there'll be an, a chat GPT or AI robot that will learn me so deeply that when I am unable to express myself, they could do it as if it were me. I I love it. Yeah, talk about an amazing use of of AI uh, and uh, artificial intelligence. I love the way you're thinking. Uh, uh, Sam. Okay, let's let's get to a few more of these here. Um, so somebody says, "Will the play only be live performances? Has a live performance of the play ever been recorded, or will it be recorded?" Thank you for these gifts to life and the whole extended family of life. Amazing inspiration. Um, I dropped in the performance, and I'll share it here. It's coming up in January at the um, Insight Memory Care Center. On January 11th, uh, Sam, I believe I talked with the woman who right. set that up, and she's going to try to record it. Correct? Yes, and I did, we did record. It. I I I have a very serious concern about record airing these things and performing in unmediated environments because of the de depth of the emotional impacts of the show and of the topics. And we do talk, you know, we we touched on suicide, but it's it is almost the backdrop of the play. It's a bare stage. It has a it is, the bare stage is the imagined Switzerland. It's a mm -hmm. small table, two chairs, and a pink cup. Yep, I and love. I'm, it. I'm a little bit because that thought we we went over pretty quick. That thought sits in so much of this dialogue. Not I'm nowhere near that anymore. I'm. You know, I'm not I'm not worried about myself. I am worried, though, about that 
to a degree for an unmediated audience and where there isn't the ability to if need be spot somebody or be there and be aware that there's a lot of suicide conversation yeah. in this play because I, you know, I, I'm shocked, not shocked, I'm just, I don't know the right word, disappointed, I, but I'm saddened the degree to which suicide is viewed as a viable option to uh, living out what can be a very challenging thing in life. Yeah, but but I, I I loved how you addressed it because it is a real emotion. Whenever we're for some people, uh, when uh, faced with news that literally is like having the rug pulled out from underneath you. And um, um, okay, we got lots of questions here, folks. I'm going to try to get to these. And um, okay. Oh, and also I want to remind folks it's about five minutes to one right now. Um, Sam and Susan, if you can hang on for a little bit longer, if those of you who need to jump off, this is recorded. It's it'll be at proaging.com. Um, let's see. Um, okay, uh, where are we at here? Um, uh, oh shoot. Uh, Jamie says this sounds so much like my mother's experience. It was so frustrating. I think that's when you were talking about the doctor's appointments. Um, Thank you, uh, Lori says, thank you, Sam and, and Susan, for your honesty and courage in sharing your story. I too run a virtual early stage support group and would be honored for you to share your story with our group. Okay, that's great. That's his, <laughs> that's his goal. Um, Deborah says, went to a neurologist to talk about things I was see seeing things that concern me. He told me to enjoy my hallucinations. I do have migraine with aura and he referred me to a headache doctor. Um, and, and again, you know, we can't sort of say that that might not be an accurate diagnosis, but as Sam had said, when you do have your diagnosis and you begin to look back in the past, it's sort of like, oh, wow, I started having significant changes at this point in my life. And I think, you know, the, the important thing with dementia is like it, you've alluded to it, Sam, is, is that, hey, look, you know, we could, you potentially untreated, you could be endangering yourself or other people potentially mm -hmm. if, if you're not managing this correctly. Can, um, I, can I just say to the person who just said that migraines, um, it was a long time ago, but I had um, cluster vascular headaches at some point, early point in my life. That's a unique form of uh, migraine. And I, I've wondered whether there would be a connection. So maybe we need to go to a neurologist and say, have you ever looked for a connection between Alzheimer's or dementia and people who've had early stage? And anyway, so I, I'm interesting to hear that. Yeah. yeah. Um, Vivian says, my husband's neurologist didn't even deliver the bad news, the diagnosis himself, but assigned it to a nurse practitioner who met with us six weeks after the neurological test. Oh my gosh. And, and I think six more weeks, six, yeah, six more, more weeks. weeks. It, you're right. It's oh. always six weeks. And, and I think, again, we know there are caring, trained, competent people in this field of neurology and memory care it's you know the the system is not supporting a, a um a better environment i would say and 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 i think people like you telling me stories is hopefully going to make change here in in the short term um uh vivian says you had talked about being an outlier. Vivian says Sam's sense of humor already makes him an outlier. <laughs> um, uh, Jamie says, looking back, there were early warning signs in my mother eight years before she even thought to go see a doctor. By the way, she also suffered from migraines, depression, and anxiety. And uh, thank you for sharing that, Jamie. And the, the you know, 
Sam, I think that you had mentioned that you, at your first doctor's visit, the doctor basically put you on some anxiety or depression meds. Yeah, mild dose of, mild dose, I call it a mild dose of, uh, of depression. Thought I had a mild dose, a mild. Which, know. you know, what you realize with when we, we're already, well, the other thing that we've got problems with is our, all of us are being over-medicated. And by you can see where that medication and in Jamie's case, you know, with her mom was probably taking some medications that basically masks right. what you're right. really feeling. And, and no, the, they so so they can mask. They right. So, so there's a value to being anxious about something that's not right, so that you get treated. If you get that anxiety gone, then you don't have the pressure to go go back. There, there, there's there's a bad loop in that that I don't know mm -hmm. that's ever been talked about. It's sort of like um, um, get away from me. Let's, if we give you this, I don't have to deal with the harder part. No, exactly. You know, and it's um, uh, and and I'll tell you something on the medications. I'm gonna uh, I'll pull it up and drop it into chat uh, because we're talking about dementia and medications. We had a another real life story that we featured on here, which was a woman who had um, she had been living in a nursing home for uh, two years diagnosed with dementia and uh, a bunch of other uh, conditions was put on hospice. And when she was put on hospice, they took her off all medications except for the pain medications and she recovered. And I actually just talked to her last week. She's living independently back in her condo before she moved to the nursing home. So medications and how we we mm -hmm. treat treat them or are, are, are knowing that is very important as deborah says some meds i am taking now can cause cognitive issues and those meds are important but you can see where it just delays uh getting that proper diagnosis um tracy says thank you for your sensitivity to the um suicide topic as it is a problem with both young and old and is devastating to families and you know uh, you're, there is a, um, uh, the percentage, there's, there are trends with older adults committing suicide. And one interesting report that I read is, is that, and I, and I know I'm going to botch this, but I think it's very important if, if it comes out anyway, is, is that suicide it is preventable if you talk to somebody, is, is that, but if you don't talk to somebody then um, you're at a higher risk. And so for anybody who has a loved one, you know, that may be facing the, these thoughts and challenges, uh, talking to a therapist and, um, and getting a perspective that, you know, thank, th thank you, uh, Sam, for not being one of those statistics because we're having this amazing conversation and inspiring tons of people today because because of because of that and um, that's that that's that 988 number now too if people yeah. want to somebody um and then let's see uh eileen says bless both of you for your transparency great work sam and susan uh paula says my daughter was recently in an airport in peru and saw a display referring to sunflower lanyards for folks with hidden disabilities that attendants can discreet, dis, discreetly help if necessary. Man, uh, uh, Paula, I'm gonna do some research on that because I think something like that would be wonderful for us to spotlight on these discussions, but that's that's what we need is, is something that doesn't sort of stigmatize um, a cognitive or mental illness, but enables us to, people to be aware that, mm -hmm. uh, that that we might be thinking differently or acting differently, um, just like somebody in a wheelchair or somebody with a walker right. uh, moves differently. Uh, so Paula, I'm going to do some research on that. And if anybody has information, just shoot me an email uh, too. Um, uh, folks love the idea of the cognitive navigator. 
Uh, Jane says the experience. Oh, I love this. Jane says the experience of doing improv strikes me as another area for finding opportunity to grow and learn to cope better when I'm in cognitive decline as Sam Simon explored. Uh, hey, uh, I will tell you, Jane, I am a huge fan of improv and uh, it is an absolutely wonderful way to exercise your brain and give you confidence, but more importantly, connect you to a community of some of the coolest people that I've ever met. <laughs> um, I, uh, I, I participate in an improv group. I don't really like being on stage. I like jamming with the improv people in our practices and just seeing where our thoughts go. And um, it's just amazing. So um, Jane, yeah. that I think is a great thing to exercise your brain with. And I think you know this, Steve, but improv as a technique for the care partner. Um, so if you have a partner, if you're ever in the environment, telling somebody with a cognitive impairment or who is, you know, advanced uh, cognitive decline, they're wrong. If you ever say yeah. no, it's just not going to work. Well, it, and, so and we don't do that in improv. It's yes and. Yes, and yes and yes and and yes and in my is is to accept all information given. And there is some great stuff on this and and uh, dementia as well. But if somebody you know there was a movie where somebody thought there were had been a, a cleaning person was whacking chairs with some sort of stick. And the, the nurse didn't say, you're not cleaning, stop doing that. They said, oh, you're almost finished cleaning. <laughs> let's make wow. this the last, let's make this the last chair. Yep. And then uh, let's go have lunch. So it was a yes. And let's go have lunch because it was there happened to be a lunch time. So, but as a human trait, I, I you know, I ran a company, I said for 20, 25 years. I, and it was during that I had learned some of my improv and it changed how I, how I dealt with employees. Oh yeah. Let you me know, tell you, yeah. a typical business meeting is, and, and conference room meeting is the exact opposite of an improv uh, jam <laughs> session. Um, okay. De I know we're, we're, we've been on for over an hour, but Deborah says there are museum tour guides as cognitive facilitators and those who work in creative expression classes, guiding caregivers and those challenge. Say, hey, Deborah, send me any information that you have on that because I would love to, to feature that as well. And then um, uh, Eileen says, have you found any dementia friendly designations or restaurants? So, so there's this de dementia friendly movement where yeah. one of the goals was to train like restaurant uh, team members about people with cognitive impairment. Um, have you stumbled into any of any of that in your travels? Not that specific thing. I want to, uh, before we get off into two minutes, reimagining dementia, if they don't know about it, it's, there's, a, there's a movement, it's called reimagining dementia, which is dedicated to, the, to just this conversation. They are sponsoring this coming week or this week, the events they call it taking it to the streets uh but it is what we're we're all talking about reimagining dimension yes jessica they are a fantastic group they and mary fridley who heads it um i reached out to her when i started with uh, having to mm -hmm. be the, the actual dancer with susan because that, that helped me um uh very much with, with with this thing so um yeah reimagining dementia and people again this goes back to the whole idea that it's not dementia it's not madness it's not insanity it's not insanity yeah it's something else and and we can have meaningful lives Yep, and I, I've um, I dropped that into chat. That's wonderful. Um, you know, in, in, I want to give you the opportunity to talk a little bit about um, uh, Jennifer Wexton because we had a conversation about her 
before we came on, I feel like we've done a good job of covering, uh, of getting an, an overview. I could talk for you for several more hours, but, um, but, but uh, Sam, do you want to sort of share some of your thoughts on Jennifer Wexton, who um, I'm going to share this opinion piece in the, um, uh, from the Washington Post today? Well, first of all, Jennifer Wexton is a congressperson who is our is a friend of ours. Um, she had uh, my son, who works in the Northern Virginia area and who is a, a member of the Virginia legislature, knew Jennifer. And uh, we, um, because she's a friend, because my son's so close, we've hosted her for every one of her, for, for her first fundraisers every campaign. But she was diagnosed, and she was in our home maybe two months ago, three months ago, but was diagnosed with, initially with Parkinson's. And she just disclosed it's called progressive supranuclear palsy, which is not curable. And um, so she's decided not to run. She was going to run for re-election with her Parkinson's, but she's not now. But it so reminded me of my own journey in so many ways. You get the diagnosis. You don't know what to do. She was determined earlier that her, you know, Alzheimer's in theory is a terminal diagnosis, that there is no cure. Um, and that's a daunting thing. And she has something for which there's no known cure and probably is going to move a little bit faster. But she is, um, the Post article said it very well, too. It, you know, I guess the my humility is that I'm not the only one doing going through this. There's so many people in this world from in different places. And um there's the tragedy narrative. There is, I think, and and look, there is we all want more time. And I'm lucky, I'm 78. Jennifer is in her 50s. Um but we, we don't control our fate. Um, I don't know whether we can do that. Coming to terms with what happens is, you know, I, I do want to give a shout out. We're Jewish, but every faith, our faith community has been extraordinarily supportive. And I just want to repeat, though, take your journey, if you're on this journey, in a way that can help others so that you can't undo what's done. You can't go backward. You can't, what we can do is the future. We still can do things. And I continue to, you know, if, if my play has any megaphone, it would be whatever time we have left, whatever, make it available to help find solutions for everybody. So I, I am in a drug trial. Uh, and I say in the play, you know, I'm, if, if any of you are Alzheimer's, it's not the amyloid one. This is for to stop the creation of the black tangles that are in the brain. I don't have tangles. I just have I'm what they call amyloid positive. And, oh, I don't have it on. I've got to put it on. I'm, I'm in a study for a watch. And the watch will, and people register, will tell me who's, who's in my house and what their name is with a picture of them. You know, it can be helpful. But if we can find in our souls, so to speak, notwithstanding how unhappy the moment is for us, man, that I, we can we can get back still. Mm -hmm. So that that's where I'm at. I, and and have amazing love partners. <laughs> not everybody is married. Not everybody's lucky enough. And there are still things you can do. I'm very very fortunate. This this has been great, um, Sam. Thanks so much for your time. Thanks for so much for everything that you're doing. And I hope it inspires others. And the woman, Ginger, that I was talking about that was in the nursing home, she's actually listening to this. And uh, she she she, she, sent, she sent me a note, Ginger, I mean, if more people can get out there and be brave enough to share their stories, it can really change the world. And, and you know, like I would take, 10 of these discussions every day of the week, as opposed to, you know, me or another expert up here talking about the 10 things that you need to do to sort of preserve your memory. When we hear these 
these these real life stories it has so much impact and um uh susan uh i i you you've been so supportive and you've got a um a, a wonderful man there that was right. uh is creative and was supportive to you but uh i know I haven't asked you that many questions, but I, I'd like to give you sort of the final word on sort of what is this what has this journey been like for you as a uh, as a family member? Um, well, the journey we, as he said, we've gotten um, we've gone from dark to opening up. Um, the play has been fantastic. People ask me how is he all the time, and I say. Be, he is doing very well because he has a purpose. And I think that's very, very important for the, the caregiver to work with the person and make sure that they have a purpose and be a part of that purpose uh, because that's what's going to make their life better and your life better. Um, there will be ups and downs. I can't say that there aren't times that we forget the yes and and we yell at each other <laughs> and then we apologize and we go back and say, oh, we should have said it this way or that way. But communication is just very, very important. And there are lots of support groups that you can go to. Uh, both for the person experiencing it and both for the caregiver. Um, and there are ones that you do together. So there are lots of different things out there. So explore them. But just remember, the most important thing is that communication between each other. Man, what well, very well said. I, I, I want to thank both of you and remind the audience, especially those that hung in for the hour and 20, uh, this recording will be there uh, this afternoon. And um, and and I'm going to make sure to get all of Sam's uh, play performances on our calendar so they're easy for you all to go out there and uh, see and meet him firsthand. Invite your friends and family because, you know, if it's hard to have a conversation like this to say, family, let's sit down and let's talk about what if I had dementia? It's I can tell you, I can guarantee this. It's a lot easier to say, I want to take you to a play, okay? And it's performed by a gentleman who has dementia. And then afterwards, you have coffee or dinner and you just, it's the dialogue's going to be much easier. Um, and uh, uh, this, this is, ex this is an exciting time in sort of helping us move the needle to better, better care. Steve, thank you for having us. And yes, thank you for definitely. this event. I really, really appreciate it. You bet. All right, folks, have a great week and we'll talk to you soon. Okay.